Om Swastiastu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Yang terhormat Senat Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budayana yang kami hormati keluarga dari Promo Pendus serta hadirin dan undangan yang kami hormati pula. Selamat pagi dan selamat datang di ruang sidang Dr. Insinyur Sutama, Gedung Berbacaraka Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budayana pada ujian sidang promosi doktor atas nama Rodney Westerreiter, MA Bank, PhD Candidate pada hari ini, Rabu 6 Mei 2020. Hadirin yang kami hormati, berikut akan kami perkenalkan Promovendus atas nama Rodney Westerreiter, MA Bank, PhD Candidate kelahiran berkendam The Netherlands 14 Juni 1982. Romo Venus berhasil menyelesaikan pendidikan selata satu di Stoas University of Applied Science pada tahun 2008. Pada tahun 2011, meraih gelar magister di Leiden University. Romo Venus tercatat sebagai karya siswa program doktor, program studi kajian budaya, fakultas ilmu budaya, universitas budayana pada tahun 2015. Adapun judul disertasi yang akan diuji pada hari ini adalah The Modification of Perception Related to Submitting Children to Child Welfare Institution in the Pasar City. Hadirin yang kami hormati, demikian setias tentang Romo Venus. Acara akan kami lanjutkan dengan pimpinan sidang promosi doktor dengan Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budayana memasuki ruang sidang Dr. Insinyur Sekai. Hadirin di mohon berdiri. Ibu Udayana. Sedang kembali. Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budayana disilakan memimpin sidang promosi doktor. Om Swastiastu. Namo Budaya. Shalom. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua Dengan memanjatkan puja dan puji syukur Kehadapan Tuhan yang mengakhirkan Atas asum kekewan mudahnya dari ide sang yang dibasa Rabu tanggal 6 bulan Mei tahun 2020 Sidang promosi doktor atas nama Rodney Westerwarkan M.A. Basel of Education 
mahasiswa pada program studi doktor kajian budaya mahasiswa angkatan tahun akademik 2015-2016 dinyatakan dibuka dan diterbuka untuk umum. Yang terhormat anggota senat fakultas ilmu budaya Universitas Udayana. Yang kami hormati Bapak, Ibu, tim promotor dan anggota tim penguji, Saudara promotenus yang terkaya, hadirin yang kami muliakan. Terlebih dahulu saya perkenalkan tim penguji Dr. Bagi Rodney Westerhaven, M.A. Pd. Tim penguji terdiri atas satu, Profesor Dr. Iwayan Abdi ke M.A. Selaku promotor sekaligus sebagai anggota. Dua, Profesor Dr. Hiroki Ketut Abdana MA. Selaku promotor satu sebagai anggota. Tiga, Profesor Dr. Inyoman Darmo Putra Emlit. Selaku promotor dua sebagai anggota. Empat, Profesor Dr. Ana Abu Anam Kumbala MA. Sebagai penguji dan sekaligus sebagai anggota penguji. 5. Profesor Dr. Imade Swasti PSU sebagai penguji dan sekaligus selaku anggota penguji. 6. Dr. Dr. Anus Industri Ginti Suka RS selaku penilai sekaligus sebagai anggota penguji. 7. Dr. Inyoman Wardi MSI selaku penilai dan sekaligus sebagai anggota penguji. 8. Dr. Igusti Agung Alek Suryawati Esos MSI sebagai penilai dan sekaligus selaku anggota penguji. Saya sendiri, Dr. Made Sri Satyawati SS Tempung, Dekan Fakultas Tim Budaya Universitas Budayana sebagai pimpinan sidang promosi dokter. Seorang dokter selain dapat menghasilkan disertasi dengan benar, juga harus dapat mempertahankan disertasi tersebut terhadap berbagai sandaran. Tim penguji dalam promosi dokter ini dimohon untuk memberi penilaian terhadap satu alur penalaran ilmiah promovenus dalam mempertahankan disertasi terhadap sandaran. Dan dua, sumbangan terhadap bidang ilmu dan atau nilai pendapatan. Sebelum ujian dimulai, saya mau bertanya kepada promo penis, apakah saudara siap untuk melaksanakan promosi doktor? Siap. Ya, baik. Promo penis dipersilakan untuk mempresentasikan hasil penelitian yang dicapai dan penemuan hal-hal yang baru pada disertasi, disertasi saudara yang berjudul The Modification of Perception Related to Submitting Children to Child Welfare Institution in Denpasar City. Saya persilakan saudara petugas waktu memberikan tanda awal pada pukul 10.25 dan berakhir pada pukul 10.45. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Om Swastiastu, Salam, Salam Kebajikan. Terima kasih Sajawati, SSM Home yang saya hormat. Promotor saya, Profesor Dr. Iwayana Dika, MA yang saya hormat. Promotor saya, Dr. Bill uh, Iktut Ardana, MA yang saya hormat. Uh, Promotor saya, Profesor Dr. I. Nyoman Termakur Putra. Emblit yang saya hormat dan koordinator pro, prodi Dr. Kajian Budaya Profesor Dr. AA Anom Kumbara MA yang saya hormat. Para penguji Profesor Dr. Imade Swastika SU yang saya hormat, Dr. Dr. Sinistri Ginting Suka MS yang saya hormat, Dr. I Nyoman Mardi MSI uh, yang saya hormat, Dr. I Gusti Agung Alit Suryawati SOS MSI yang saya hormat. Dan para penonton, Bapak Raja Kelungkung, Ida Dalam Semara Putra yang saya hormat, Ratau Ida Dalam Prama Deksita di Puri Putra yang saya hormat, teman-teman dan keluarga di Indonesia maupun di Kerajaan Belanda yang saya hormat, 
khususnya Ibu dan Bapak saya, dan teman-teman studi dokter Kajian Budaya Angkatan 2015 yang saya hormat. Welcome to my presentation uh, for uh, my public events. So, as I said, the presentation is about my dissertation, the modification of perception related to submitting children to child welfare institutions in Denpasar City. Um, I will present a number of things, the research sample, the research outcomes, uh, a spe specific note to Kota Layak Anak, uh, implications and conclusions, philosophies used in the field of cultural studies related to this dissertation, the benefits, and then we uh, move on to the questions. So to start with the research sample, um, I have looked at Denpasar City, um, spe specifically because Denpasar City has a very um, um, how to say um, community that is uh, very wide and from different uh, cultures. But I've looked at the Hindu uh, people, at the Balinese people within this community. Um, so the criteria was that somebody was born from a Balinese family. Within that sample, there were actually 58% uh, children that are still Hindu, Christian 20%, multi-religious, so multi-religious orphanages 16%, and Muslim 6%. Then, uh, according to um, other researches that have been done, for example, by Save the Children, I have uh, made age groups 5 to 9, 10 to 14, 15 to 17, and older than 17, and divided that up in boys and girls. Um, and this has been calculated on the fact of actually children that are living in those age groups within those child welfare institutions. You will see that I use child wel welfare institutions and orphanages. Um, orphanage is the popular name given to those institutions but obviously we should talk about child welfare institutions. Um, also, I have done research with uh, family members uh, and that consisted of one aunt, one brother-in-law, 10 fathers, one grandfather, nine, mother and, nine mothers and one sister. So if we are looking at the research child welfare institutions, the child welfare institutions that wanted to join this research, uh, then uh, we have um, a number of nine different uh, institutions. One uh, a Muslim institution, Yai Samplangi Anak Negeri. Then a number of Christian uh, institutions, Palak Salamatan Nugra Putri, Eben Aesar, Elis Sama, and William Booth. And a number of uh, Hindu uh, child welfare institutions, Tarmajati, Sunyagiri, and Tatwamasi and one multi-religious institution, Yai San Kasi Peduliana. So, if we look at the research outcomes, first of all, the status of the parents is very important. Uh, where in the Western world, an orphanage is seen as a place where children live that have no parents. The situation here in Indonesia, and specifically, specifically in my uh, research uh, area, was that actually uh, a lot of children still have uh, their parents alive. 76% uh, of the children that live in orphanages in the bus are still have both parents alive or no, 76%. Uh, 16% on top of that has still one parent alive or no. And actually only 8% of uh, the sample of 50 children that I have researched had non no parents alive or no which is uh, very different than the situation uh, in other countries uh, in the Western world. So if we look at the children that are living in uh, those child welfare institutions in Denpasar, I've looked at the Kabupaten and the Kota in uh, Denpasar, in, sorry, in Bali. So you can see that 2% is coming from, ba from Badung, 2% uh, from Bangli, 2% from Klungkung, 2% is also unknown. Those are the children that uh, have no parents alive or no. Um, some of them knew where they were coming from, was also one that didn't know that. Uh, Nagara, 8%, Bulaleng, 14%, Ianya, 14%, Tabanan, 14%. The biggest areas is Denpasar themselves and Karangasam, 22%. The reason that children are being submitted to child welfare institutions 
First of all is education. 29 of the children uh, that were being researched, 29 out of 50, actually live in the child welfare institution basically uh, only for education. Seven of the 50 are there for economic hardship. Um, and economic hardship, of course, leads also to the problem of not being able to follow education. Um, six of them were there because of family situation of sick or sickness. One was a neglected child. Two were sent there to be independent. And for five of them, uh, it was unknown. These are uh, mainly the smaller children. Um, so the reactions of parents and the familial caregivers uh, involved in this re research were very diverse. Uh, some parents actually shared feelings of shame and guilt, guilt regarding the situation. It was actually not a good choice to bring their children to child welfare institutions. Um, and results regarding reactions of the parents were also inconclusive. Uh, it, but it did help the familial atmosphere of submitting children to child wel welfare institutions because many of them also said, it's okay, it's no problem, or even related to other family members to also bring their children to a child welfare institution. So seen in the identified reaction from family, mainly the extended family does not mind that one of the children is surrendered to a child welfare institution. And even though cases of abuse are happening, and within my dissertation, within my research, I came across uh, cases of abuse, and also they reach the media frequently, where parental caretakers actually put a good trust in the child welfare institution's management of the staff. And Regarding to the media, they think it's not always correct what is being told in the media. So actually violence and abuse is apparent in those child welfare institutions. Uh, the cases that I have identified within uh, the child welfare institutions have been forwarded to Project, Project Karma, which is an Australian based but uh, operating in Indonesia uh, foundation who is uh, trying to protect children from abuse especially in orphanages or in child welfare institutions. Some parents, though, they show regret, um, and uh, though others don't show any regret or shame. So the main issue for many is described by the mother of one of the children, uh, a girl that lives in a multi-religious uh, orphanage, um, 70 years old, that simply said, there are no other choices. In fact, according to the law, there should be other choices, but the law, unfortunately, is not implemented well. So it can be concluded that 76% of the children researched still have both parents alive, and another 16% of the children had one parent alive and known. Therefore, the translation of orphanage for Pantyaswan is incorrect, and even though the term orphanage is often used in the marketing of child welfare institutions, uh, basically because when uh, the word orphanage is used, uh, reaching the tourist industry on Bali, reaching to the Western world, the Australian world, uh, the word orphanage is an easy way to attract people to actually donate and to help those orphanages. So the main reason given for children living in child welfare institutions is the possibility to follow education, uh, economic hardship, the family situation, and sickness or being neglected and learning to be independent. The decree of the Minister of Social Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia, number 30, book uh, 2011, actually prohibits submittance to child welfare institutions for the sake of education. In this case, if children are being submitted for the sake of education, the child welfare institutions are supposed to provide support for the family through financial assistance, like the tuition costs, school supplies, and transportation, or economic empowerment of the family or assist the family in accessing social aid programs. Instead, um, those child welfare institutions are accepting children that can take care of themselves and let them live in the house solely for the reason of being able to follow education, even recruit in poor areas based on this. So parents and familial caretakers are actually executing the ostrich syndrome having no long-term vision, but seeking solutions for short terms without wanting to see consequences. Answers given by parental and parents and familial caretakers about their feelings were diverse. Uh, 
uh, diverse, possibly driven by feelings of guilt and shame. Taken to the level of the cloaca and the cloaca bazaar, it is identified that the family does not care too much that one of the children is submitted to such a child welfare institution. Even members of the nuclear family refer to child welfare institutions. Parents and familial caretakers see submittance to child welfare institutions as a solution, and sometimes even an easy solution. In hindsight, some parents showed regret, but the majority does not regret submitting their children to a child welfare institution. Children are experiencing psychological and emotional stress as they are deprived from family's love and care. Family relations and the Balinese kinship system is disrupted due to having children surrendered to the child welfare institutions. Parents, familial caretakers do not want to see those consequences in the long run. Psy uh, physical, psychological and sexual abuse, as I already mentioned, is happening frequently in those child welfare institutions. And as I said, Within this research, cases of physical and psychological abuse are discovered. When we're looking at philosophies, um, I had a focus in this research on kinship, on parenthood, norms, morals, and ethics. And I chose the work of Foucault to uh, mirror my dissertation. To, to give the dissertation philosophy, Philosophical reserve, the work of Nagy Foucault has been reconstructed, especially looking at Aletheia, Politeia, and Ethos. When looking at Aletheia, the production of truth, one can relate issues of short term vision by parents and familial caretakers. Specifically relating to the child's safety, one can conclude that Aletheia is disturbed. The exercise of power, Politeia, is binary. The prescribing authority, the director general, has executed this task well by a well taught through decree. So the implementation by means of the social service is inadequate. Actually, the decree from the director general is better than the United Nations rights of the child, though the implementation needs to be better. When deconstructing ethos, the amalgamation of norms, morals, uh, and the discrepancy between the parents, familial caretakers, and the child is compromised. Foucault describes that the best place for a child is to be with a nuclear family. Submitting children to a child welfare institution has become a part of normalization, a rising norm, a natural rule, which can be considered dangerous, seeing the many cases of abuse and the estrangement of children to their nuclear family and kinship ties. It has to be concluded that the ethos, the moral formation, is victimized by the failing system of Aletheia and Politeia but that also ethos itself is victimized by contemporary forms of normalization. The traditional kinship system in which everyone belonging or feeling to belong to a common ancestor is a, usually a system in which people help each other. Due to everyone being in the same position of coping with a crisis instigated by the heavily decreased tourist arrivals after the second Bali bomb, the kinship system fell apart. There are indications that at this that this is the moment on which child welfare institutions started to recruit more actively in less privileged areas. The vast submittance to child welfare institutions instigated a trend, possibly led by peer pressure, and, e and uh, seeing an easy solution for the existing problem. As explained before, there is no long-term vision by parents and familial caretakers within submitting children to child welfare institutions. The trend of submitting children to those child welfare institutions in the first years after the second Bali bomb instigated a change in the social cultural system on Bali. Now, the kinship system partly fell apart as a result of the Bali bombings. Kalawarga Basar is less considered to ask for help, and submitting a child to a child welfare institution became an easy solution. The current crisis, such as COVID 19, which we are dealing with right now, has similar effects on child, uh, on, to the field of child welfare institutions on Bali. At this moment, the first reports of children being submitted to child welfare institutions in the Pasar uh, due to COVID-19 are already received. And that also means that my research, even though today is uh, the end of the period, will continue and will go on to see the effects and to be able to see the effects mir mirrored to what happened after the second Bali bomb. Two sisters, eight and five years old, you can see them here on the picture, have been submitted to a child welfare institution in the Basar. The reason 
given is the lack of financial income due to COVID-19. And as I said, I will continue to monitor this case and see what is going on. If we look at the benefits of my dissertation, the benefits in part is can be governmental, governmental disaster management companies or agencies such as BMPB, the Badan Nasional Pengangkulungan Bencana, but also governmental agencies coordinating child welfare institutions and regulations, so, uh, such as Komnas PA, um, and also the National Commission for Protection of Children and Social Service on national, provincial, as well as regional level, as well as working governmental institutions such as Kota Layakana. Then pass our bonus prize last year for being such a great city for uh, children. And even though I've tried to uh, have a meeting with uh, governmental agencies for the pass relating to this, my meetings uh, requests were not uh, being honored. Um, as it is very important that actually also the municipality knows what is going on actually in those child welfare institutions. Secondly, this dissertation is not only for all NGOs supporting child welfare institutions and for those who are not affiliated with an NGO but support child welfare institutions privately. This dissertation is giving those NGOs, such as UNICEF and Save the Children, and individuals, and those individuals are widely spread all over the world that are raising funds to actually help uh, child welfare institutions um, in a good or in a not good way. Um, and this dissertation gives a on the characteristics of child welfare institutions in the past and its inhabitants. Thirdly, this dissertation is of the government agencies, particular the provincial and the regional social service. This moment. Selanjutnya untuk 80 menit ke depan adalah sesi tanya jawab dari tim penguji atau penyangga kepada pemutus. Tanpa mengurangi hak para penguji atau penyangga, sidang ini tidak menjadi ajang diskusi mengenai materi dan analisis statistik disertasi yang telah diputuskan dan disetujui oleh panitia ujian doktor tertutup. Karena banyaknya penanya yang menggunakan kesempatan ini. Kami mohon kesediaan saudara penguji untuk membatasi waktu dan jumlah pertanyaan. Penguji mengajukan pertanyaan satu persatu sehingga diharapkan semua penguji mendapat kesempatan. Saya mohon saudara petugas waktu memberi tanda awal pada pukul 10.45 menit dan berakhir pada pukul 12.45 Persilahkan yang saya hormati, saudara promotor Profesor Dr. Iwayan Ardi Berkenta. Baik, selamat pagi, Ibu Dekan, Bapak-Bapak dan Ibu para penguji yang saya hormati, yang saya banggakan sebagai Rudy Kristelaken. Congratulations for completion your dissertation. Saya memiliki dua pertanyaan untuk Rodney. Pertanyaan saya yang pertama, dalam temuan disertasi Anda, Anda mengatakan bahwa ada sejumlah physical, psychological abuse and also sexual abuse occur at the child care welfare institution. Mm -hmm. My question is, why the Department of Social Affairs didn't take any action on that matter? Okay. Um, thank you for your question, uh, Professor Dr. Iwayana Dika. Um, so, the situation is quite difficult uh, relating to your question. Uh, first of all, there are many uh, child welfare institutions that are not fully registered. Uh, for example, in this research, there was one child, well in, child welfare institution that has uh, had a case uh, of sexual abuse by the uh, son of the owner of the child welfare institution. 
And uh, when the news came out, uh, it turned out that this child welfare institution was not registered uh, fully with uh, Dina Socia, which led to a case that Dina Socia actually cannot do anything because officially this child welfare institution doesn't exist. The uh, solution to this was because uh, the, the local community, the Banja, wanted this uh, case to be ruled and to that something happened, is that this child welfare institution actually moved to another Banja where the abuse likely has been going on for another few years. Um, also, uh, the, uh, the, the controlling organizations like, for example, uh, Dina Socia, um, have a lot of cases on their hand, which means that um, also cases are not being picked up or not uh, being followed up immediately uh, and cases have been moving on. Luckily, with uh, an organization like Praya Karma uh, now operating in Bali since a few years, you see that cases are better picked up and that uh, there is an agent that is fighting for the rights of those children. Okay. Now, I continue my second question. Mm -hmm. We know that Den Pasar has been rewarded as Kota Laya Anak. Yes. In reality, as you mentioned in your dissertation, there are no other physical, psychological, and sexual abuse going on in Denpasar. Yeah. What is your opinion on this matter? Um. Thank you again uh, for your question. Um, according to me, um, a city that has uh, that is not aware of the issues that are actually going on within its own uh, vicinity should not receive such a price. The difficulty here is is that there is no awareness, uh, and this is basically uh, one one big part of this problem is that so many child welfare institutions are not registered for and therefore actually um, also an award giving uh, institution like Kotalaya uh, Anak, but also uh, perhaps the municipality itself is not aware of actually the issues that are here. Uh, I have tried to meet the mayor uh, on three different occasions and unfortunately every time just before the meeting the meeting got cancelled um, but I'm hoping that after this dissertation, I'm still be will be able to actually meet with the mayor to discuss these kind of problems. Okay, thank you. Terima kasih, Ibu Rekan. Hello, good morning. Ronnie, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, I, have, I have two questions to you because uh, I I can enjoy your research project and uh, I have two questions. The first one is about uh, because uh, study for me it's not uh, common yeah, because uh, the role of uh, State. I mean, to what extent the role of state in controlling these children care? Because you just refer to the Undang Undang Nomor 10, yeah. Maybe you have some uh, proposal to this and some uh, recommendation that then we can ask for the revision of the government uh, decree or the, uh, the, for the government regulation. Do you have any idea on this? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so, um, for me, this dissertation also don't, uh, doesn't stop after today. Um, and, and we spoke about this on, on an earlier occasion uh, that actually I have my own foundation here in, in Bali, West Laka Foundation of Yaisa Bali Bursi. And one of the objectives of my foundation is to actually take care of the situation that I have described in my dissertation. So, um, 
Actually, the law itself is written really good. Um, the law I referred to earlier. It's better than actually the uh, UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. The, the problem is in implementation. Um, for example, why are still uh, orphanages or child welfare institutions at this moment being registered? Well, actually the law says that uh, child welfare or uh, institutions should not be existing anymore. And that children cannot live longer than nine months within a child welfare institution and then should move on to a foster family. And that if a child stays longer in such an institution, it should be of a very, very well taught reason. For example, uh, children that are very sick and parents that will not take care of them or even steal medicines from the, that are uh, proposed for the children. And at such a moment, the children can stay in an institution. Um, so, where my recommendation is that uh, one should really look at the implementation of the law. Uh, so, for example, at Dina Social, uh, how aware are uh, those uh, people that work there of the current law? But also at the level of the child welfare institutions themselves, what is the actual reason of a child welfare institution to actually start this child welfare institution? Um, is it to really take care of children that are in need? Is it to provide education? Because the law says that education is not a reason for children to be submitted in, in, uh, in a child welfare institution. Or is it actually to uh, spread religion? Uh, as we are aware that some uh, child welfare institutions, actually their first objective is to spread religion. Or, uh, and it is known that in Bali, there are a few child well, at least a few child well, institutions that are actually having the first objective to gather money instead of taking care of children. So I just continue for my second question. Mm -hmm. So do you see any changes and continuities on how the Balinese in facing these uh, disturbances because uh, your cases is related to the uh, um, human disaster, but what happened if the disaster is related to the natural disaster? Um, so basically, um, if we are looking at the period which I did my research, so that is basically from 2015 to 2019, I have not seen a significant change in how children are being submitted, how uh, child welfare institutions are actually recruiting. Um, and I think we are now at the moment where change possibly is going to happen. With those two first children that are being submitted uh, to a child welfare institution in the BASA related to COVID-19. And um, at this moment, we cannot evaluate yet what the impact of COVID-19 will be on Bali. But we can see that Bali is very empty and that company after company and hotel after hotel are falling down and that the results of COVID-19 could be actually as big as the results after the Bali bomb. Um, only time will, will learn us, uh, but that's also one of the reasons why I continue to do my research even after this moment, because this is a very important moment in time. And I'm hoping that within this time, we could actually see the change happening and see the result, for example, of my dissertation um, in, in knowledge and uh, how people are uh, on, the, on, on the governmental side, but also on the orphanage, on the child welfare institution side, are making a change. Okay, thank you, Rene. Thank you for your question and your research survey. And then I just uh, want to say uh, congrats, and this is uh, your turn, Dekan. Thank you, and good morning. Selanjutnya saya persilakan informasi saudara Kopro Kedua Profesor Dr. Kinyaman Darmo. Ya, terima kasih. Uh, pertama untuk Rodney, bisa minta tolong agar slide-nya diturunkan dulu. Because uh, we don't need it anymore and also it's nothing interesting on the slide. Put it off, please. Thank you. Thank you.
it's still there. Um, it should be yeah. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's a lot better to see other people who join this uh, exam. Uh, saya akan menyampaikan pertanyaan saya dalam bahasa Indonesia. Dan saya yakin uh, Rode akan bisa menjawab dengan baik. Yang pertama berkaitan dengan pendapat Foucault. Ya. Tadi Rodney uh, mengutip bahwa lebih baik untuk anak tinggal bersama keluarganya daripada di uh, hmm, child care. Dalam situasi normal, uh, rasanya itu baik sekali. Kita setuju. Uh, kalau keluarganya baik, mampu, tidak perlu mengirim anak ke panti asuhan. Tapi kalau keluarganya miskin, ya, kemungkinan untuk terjadi kekerasan pada anak juga kadang-kadang sulit dihindari. Ya, walaupun dia sama keluarga intinya, kalau mereka miskin mungkin mereka tidak akan diberikan pergi ke sekolah, mereka diminta untuk jadi pengemis, jadi ada semacam verbal violence terhadap anak-anak. Nah, pertanyaan saya, apa pendapat Rode tentang itu? Kemudian, apakah dalam penelitian menemukan keluarga yang tidak mampu, tetapi bertahan untuk mengajak anaknya tanpa melakukan kekerasan? Silakan. Oke, okay. uh, terima kasih buat pertanyaannya. Um, saya coba jawab dalam bahasa Indonesia, uh, tapi mungkin sedikit campur-campur. Um, jadi, uh, memang ada situasi uh, bahwa anak-anak memang uh, tidak bisa tinggal sama keluarga yang uh, tadi saya juga sampaikan. Uh, contohnya, ada satu uh, child welfare institution yang um, mereka Um, uh, ada anak-anak yang ada HIV AIDS, ada tuberkulosis begitu. Dulu mereka ada program untuk mengirim obat-obat ke anak-anak itu di desa. Ternyata ibu dan bapak juga kena HIV AIDS itu, dan ibu dan bapak karena mungkin malu ke puskesmas untuk dapat obat-obat yang gratis, makan obatnya anak itu. Jadi kalau check up itu, Jakob anak itu kesatannya turun terus. Bagaimana bisa? Karena anak ini sudah dapat obat yang bagus begitu. Ternyata ibu dan bapak yang minum obatnya. Kalau ada situasi seperti itu, memang lebih baik anak itu tunggu di child welfare institution karena nggak bisa disakiti oleh orang tua. Kalau unang Indonesia sudah bilang. Kalau ten, uh, anak itu harus disubmit ke Panti Aswan um, cuma dengan dengan alasan edukasi, pendidikan, itu memang tidak boleh. Tapi kalau saya lihat dari 50 anak ini, sudah ada 29 yang tinggal di Panti Aswan dengan, uh, dengan alasan pertama, edukasi. Jadi itu memang uh, tidak benar. Um, sebenarnya saya... Uh, dalam dalam riset ini saya melihat anak-anak yang sudah tinggal di Panti Asfan. Jadi saya nggak ketemu sama orang tua yang uh, masih ada anak di rumah uh, dan nggak dikirim ke Panti. Tapi uh, kalau kalau saya uh, cara yang baik seperti itu memang harus ikut uh, undang-undang yang sudah ada. Jadi Uh, kalau ada orang yang mau uh, bawa anaknya ke Panti Aswan karena edukasi, sebenarnya memang harus uh, Panti Aswan itu seharusnya uh, cari uh, cara buat keluarga itu untuk dapat uang supaya mereka uh, bisa tanggung jawab sendiri untuk anaknya bisa ke sekolah. Jadi itu economic empowerment itu. Uh, buat kekerasan anak di, di rumah tangga itu, saya belum lihat relasi dengan ke sekolah atau enggak, atau tinggal di Panti Asman atau enggak. Yang yang kekerasan itu, yang physical, psychological abuse itu, um, yang saya ketemu di, di Panti Asman itu, ya itu memang di Panti Asman. Tapi ya ada kemungkinan uh, itu terjadi di, 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 di 
di rumah tangga juga. Terima kasih. Jawabannya bagus. Pertanyaan berikutnya berkaitan dengan alasan uh, mengapa orang tua mengirim uh, anaknya ke uh, panti asuhan. Dan dalam diskusi tadi dan juga dalam disertasi, Rodney memberikan alasan karena Bali bombing 2002 dan 2005. Uh, memang tragedi 2002 dan 2005 itu membuat memberikan dampak yang cukup keras untuk pariwisata, tetapi tidak lama karena pemulihan terjadi dengan sangat cepat karena adanya bantuan dari berbagai negara pariwisata tidak lama setelah 2002 itu sudah bangkit lagi kena 2005 bangkit lagi sehingga sebetulnya uh, saya ragu bahwa alasan Bali bombing itu membuat orang tua menghadapi masalah ekonomi untuk kirim anaknya ke Panti Asuhan. Saya curiga yang terjadi adalah karena memang kemiskinan struktural para orang tua tersebut ada atau tidak bom, mereka memang dalam keadaan yang malang. Entah karena nasibnya atau karena malasnya, memang sulit dihindari bom ikut menentukan. Tapi kalau Rodney mengatakan dan menjadikan ini alasan, mungkin menurut saya perlu diperlunak. Silakan berikan komentarnya. Ya. Kalau saya uh, lihat, ada beberapa hal yang, yang uh, saya mau sampaikan dalam uh, jawab saya. Jadi yang pertamanya, uh, saya fokus dengan Bali Bom yang kedua, yang 2005. Uh, kalau lihat dampaknya, 2006, 2007, uh, begitu, Uh, dilihat bahwa memang uh, di tahun 2006 itu turis-turis sudah datang lagi ke Indonesia. Tapi kalau saya lihat turis dari dunia Eropa, di dunia Australia gitu, memang masih takut untuk ke Bali lagi. Karena diingat 2002 sudah ada, 2015, uh, 2005 lagi ada bom. Jadi turis-turis yang datang uh, memang Uh, banyak yang dari Malaysia, dari Thailand, dari Singapura gitu, dan uh, uh, spendingnya mereka memang jauh lebih kecil dari turis-turis yang datang dari uh, Australia, dari Eropa. Jadi memang kalau melihat uh, turis yang sudah datang lagi, memang sudah cukup banyak pada tahun 2006, 2007, tapi income-nya masih kurang. Um, yang kedua, uh, mari saya cek karena pertanyaannya nah, cukup besar. Um, oh ya, kalau kalau melihat um, ada graf dari uh, dinas statistik uh, pada 2006 memang banyak sekali anak-anak dibawa ke panti asuhan pada 2000, tahun 2006 dan 2007. Jadi memang kalau lihat grafnya memang begini. Um, jadi memang dari itu kalau melihat uh, angkanya di Denpasar tetap tinggi. Jadi habis 2004 masih di bawah, terus 2006 ke atas dan tetap tinggi aja. Jadi saya cari uh, kenapa apa yang terjadi pada tahun itu yang bisa jadi alasannya kenapa banyak sekali anak-anak dibawa ke Panti Asuhan pada tahun ini. Jadi saya coba melihat semua aja yang yang terjadi, tapi terus saya ketemu bom Bali, bom Bali. Jadi menurut saya memang bom Bali itu inti pertama untuk bawa anak-anak ke Panti Asuhan. Kalau lihat riset yang lain juga tentang coping mechanism, um, melihat setiap kali yang reducing expenditure itu yang pertama jadi orang-orang jual uh, mobil jual motor jual tanah dan ternyata karena memang nggak ada uang uh, mereka uh, milih untuk bawa anak ke panti asuhan dan ini juga mungkin karena di tetangga atau di adik kakak udah ada anak yang dibawa jadi terlihat oh ini memang gampang cuma harus bawa terus 
di sana di Panti Asuhan udah tanggung jawab dengan uang sekolah, uang makan, uang, uang pakaian, buat sabun, sikat gigi, semuanya ditanggung jawab. Jadi memang gampang. Dan itu memang saya maksud juga dengan presentasi saya, Austria Syndrome itu. Jadi karena itu semuanya sudah baik-baik, ya gampang. Jadi nggak uh, mau lihat uh, hal yang lain seperti abuse itu. Karena ini sudah gampang. Uh, dan satu hal lagi yang saya mau sampaikan, bukan semua orang tua yang uh, bawa anak-anak ke panti asfal memang miskin. Ada orang tua yang punya mobil, punya rumah gede, punya rumah yang bagus, tapi tetap anaknya dibawa ke panti asuhan. Uh, ada uh, uh, satu anak yang saya uh, tahu dari dari sebelum saya buat riset ini, dia dibawa ke panti asuhan karena cewek dan adik uh, ada empat adik memang di panti asuhan semua cewek karena dibawa ke panti asuhan karena memang cewek karena bapaknya memang mau punya cowok. Jadi memang ada banyak alasan. Ya, saya kira cukup. Terima kasih. Baik, saya persilakan yang saya hormati pada kunci Profesor Dr. Anna Agung Anangku Bara MA. Terima kasih yang terhormat pimpinan sidang, bapak-bapak dan ibu-ibu penguji yang lain yang saya hormati, saudara Bruno Pendus yang terpelajar. I have two question for you, ya. Yeah. I try to use the, yeah, an English. Ya, yeah, first according to your uh, data and quantitative, ya. Yeah. Especially I find you find out that 76% uh, yeah, of the case uh, have the complete, yeah, complete parent, yeah, main complete parent, yeah, that they have mother and father. Uh, but I don't yet uh, you yeah, uh, explain more. I need you should be yeah, explain me more. Uh, based on the culture studies perspective yeah uh, my question that why like this what the meaning 76% uh, yeah the father yeah yeah submitting to the yayasan and then yeah perspective Foucault, like yeah that's a, a question mark yeah but you reasoning uh, based on the marks because the reason is the economic problem i don't agree like that if you yeah settle like this that's mean you stale marxist not pukodian or so on like this because you yeah try to explain uh, yeah, cause of the economic problem yeah this uh my question continue to yeah from uh, dharma putra like this yeah i want you uh, explain me more uh, Uh, based on the culture studies perspective, not reasoning, yeah, of the economic, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the the seventy six percent to to answer that question. Um, so that's actually the whole start of the research. So when we are looking at that seventy six percent of children that are being submitted to child welfare institutions while having both children alive. Um, sorry, to have both parents of life. Uh, actually, this proves that uh, child welfare institution is seen from a Western perspective. And I think that makes this research also interesting because I have been diving into the Balinese culture with a Western uh, perspective as I was being born in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, proves that actually the child welfare institutions, or as they like to call themselves orphanages, are not what an orphanage actually is. If we use the, your, the word orphanage, this is a place where children are living that have no parents alive, that have nobody else in the world to care of them except for this orphanage. And 
Uh, when we look at this in Indonesia or Bali, or even more specific on my research area in the Pasa, when 76% of the children still have the, both their parents alive, it means that the perception of what a child welfare institution is, is very different. Then if you compare this with the, the law as well, that you see that 29 children out of 50 children are living in uh, this child welfare institution because the sake of education. And this education is actually uh, a, not a valid reason to be submitted to a child welfare uh, institution. Then we can see that there is an issue uh, that uh, is uh, not a whole. Um, so if we're looking from a cultural uh, studies perspective, when we're looking at the role of power, uh, then we can see that the power that such a child welfare institution has, uh, both in actually being able to uh, have uh, abuse going on, being able to be under the radar for uh, services like the social service or the social, because uh, the registrations are not complete, but also to have the power to go recruiting to other areas, to poor areas, to actually attract uh, children to child welfare institutions. Well, actually, this is against the law. We can see a big power problem. Does this answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question, yeah, the, the second question. I continue to uh, be on the Foucault theory, yeah, Foucault theory mm -hmm. that, and you uh, find out also, you conclude that uh, uh, you find the false of system, yeah, false system. Mm -hmm. That's mean Aletia and also Paletia, yeah. Not only in yeah, in Aletia and Paletia, but also in the victim of the yeah, content form of normalisasi. What you mean like this? What what you mean? You conclude this very very abstract. Yeah, could you explain more practices and empiric uh, uh, of your find out and conclusion your research? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for that, I would like to share the uh, the slide uh, based on this. Um, then it's a bit more easy to give a good uh, explanation on that. Um, let me just find the right slide for you. Using the actions. Yeah. So. Um, in the slide, it says to give this dissertation philosophical uh, research, the work of many Foucault has been deconstructed, specifically looking at Aletheia, Politeia, and Ethos. So, looking at Aletheia, so the production of truth. So, what is actually really true and what is just a perception? Uh, one can relate issues of short term vision by parents, familial caretakers. So, that ostrich syndrome. So, parents are actually looking away knowing that there are issues of, uh, of abuse going on, for example, but also children that are not really feeling ties with their parents anymore. Um, uh, and well, as I say here, specifically to child, child safety, one can conclude that it's Alitea, uh, so, so the, 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 the production of truth. So what is the truth and the perspective of parents uh, is, uh, disrupted. Um, so the exercise of power, uh, power politeia is binary. So uh, that's actually my uh, last answer to you as well. The, the, on one hand, the Director General has uh, made a really good law, uh, better than the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. Uh, but on the other hand, the implementation really needs to be better. The implementation is inadequate because child welfare institutions are not being controlled the way they should be controlled. Cases of abuse are being uh, unmonitored. Uh, for example, the child welfare institution I told you about that just moved Banja uh, because the Banja that where the, uh, the the child welfare institution was located uh, didn't want this child welfare institution be located in this Banja anymore. 
but then the child welfare institution was not fully registered as being a child welfare institution. And the solution given was to just move to another bandha. Moving to another bandha does not make that the abuse, the sexual abuse that was going on is going to stop. Because even the abuser, the person that did this abuse to seven, uh, sorry, to three different children within this child welfare institution, lived within the uh, child welfare institution, within the Pantias one, after this case happened. So they moved to another Pantia, and the person that did this still lived within the Pantias one. And likely the new Pantia didn't even know what was going on. Um, so, um, yeah, it is very, the, 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 the exercise of power is very binary. On one hand, there is a very good law. On the other hand, the implementation is very weak. And if you look at ethos, so the norms, morals, and ethics, um, then you can see that the, the, the relation between parents or familial caretakers, uh, grandparents, uncles, aunties, uh, and the child are being compromised. And especially this is a danger to Bali as the familial ties, the kinship system is so important. And you see that uh, due to children living in, in those child welfare institutions, and looking for a sense of belonging. And this specifically happens to children that are being submitted to Christian uh, child welfare institutions um, because they are learning how to pray Christian way, they're learning to read the Bible, to sing Christian songs. But then when it's Galungan or Puningan or Nepi, those children are going home and need to learn uh, or need to pray again in the family temple. And those children are very confused and they are, have no idea what actually their norms and the morals and ethics regarding to their Balinese life is, or to their Christian life when they're in the orphanage. Yes, you know, yeah, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sidang, terima kasih. Yeah. Selanjutnya, saya persilahkan yang saya hormati, saudara penguji, Profesor Dr. Imadi Swastika S. Dengar suara saya, selamat pagi. Dengar Pak. Saya. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. pagi. Ibu pimpinan sidang yang saya hormati. Saudara Rodney, Romo Pelus. Good luck. Today you are presentation. Your dissertation. My question, I have two in Indonesian or English. Campur campur. Apa apa? Can you repeat then? How many of children were taken care by Yayasan Sosial in the pasar and where is training and location? so much unfortunately i cannot hear your question clearly i prepared then please yeah you can repeat how many children mm -hmm. were taken by yayasan social in the pasar and when is place when is where is places di mana tempatnya itu yayasan apa namanya Mm -hmm. um, so actually, uh, um, the the number of orphanages in Denpasa, and I can just scroll to give you the right number here. So you just give me one moment. Um, so at this moment, 
there are 596 children living in registered orphanages in uh, Denpasar, uh, and that's a total of uh, 11 registered orphanages in, uh, in, in Denpasar. Uh, actually, this, uh, you can find this list in my dissertation on page 29 and page 30. And then there is a number of 223 children uh, that uh, are living in orphanages in child welfare institutions that are not registered in uh, with the social service with Dina Social. So those are orphanages or child welfare institutions that don't have their registration up to date. Yeah. So they don't have the recommendation from uh, Dina Social to actually operate. Number two, I have the children having education, having living on the run, yeah, yeah, do, and maybe good location job. Could you repeat the question, please? I said the children have having education, having living on the run, to be yeah, do, and maybe good proper job in Yayasan Social. So, um, at this moment, um, study yang layak untuk ya hidup bagi anak-anak itu. Thank you. So, uh, at this moment, uh, all those children that are living uh, in, in child welfare institutions, so that 596 uh, children in registered orphanages and 223 children uh, that are living in, uh, in in child welfare institutions that are not registered, they're all uh, following education. The ones that are not uh, following education anymore, that are just finished, uh, so there will be a new wave coming in the in the coming months. They usually, uh, and that depends a bit on the child welfare institution, have a period between three and six months to leave the institution and start uh, making a living for their own. And some of the child welfare institutions uh, actually hire uh, two or three children that are graduated from high school uh, or from, in some cases, from university to uh, remain within the orphanage to actually take care of the younger children. Terima kasih. Ibu pimpinan sidang atas kesempatan yang diberikan kepada saya. Saya punya dua pertanyaan. Saudara Rodney, ada dua pertanyaan. Pertama, uh, bahwa uh, in one of your novelties of the study, you mentioned that child welfare institution in Denpasar City mainly use education as a factor of accepting children or even recruiting children though this is forbidden yeah mm -hmm. we say forbidden by decree of the minister of social where of the republic of indonesia number 13 2011 yeah now uh, i want to ask you i want to as you, uh, as long as I know that the social minister of social regulation number 13 uh, does not prohibit accepting of recruiting children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not prohibit. Yeah, but say that children social welfare institution are the less alternative in the children care, but the less alternative in children care. 
could you explain this your pending yes so uh if we look at the at the decree of the director general uh the republic of indonesia relating to this um what is being said is that children should, should not be su submitted to child welfare institutions for the sake of education uh it's in the first pages of of, uh, of the document that children should never be sent to those child welfare institutions based on education um the only way that children could live according to the degree uh in child welfare institutions uh is uh in situations that i mentioned before uh, to professor dharma putra where children are being uh in a harmful situation when they stay at home for example because parents are not uh, giving the much needed medicines, for example, for HIV AIDS to their children, uh, but instead are taking the medicines themselves, which in due time will mean that the child will actually die. But the decree is very clear on uh, education should never be the reason, and that actually the, uh, the, uh, the decree also mentions that the child welfare institutions have alternatives to actually uh, help children that are about to be submitted to a child welfare institution. For example, by creating economic empowerment yeah. for their family, or for example, to uh, buy uh, clothes that are needed to go to school, shoes or, or uniform, or to pay for the tuition fee. And in that way, if a child welfare institution would help the family by giving the uniform and shoes, uh, and pay the tuition fee. This would mean that there is no reason for this child to actually live in a child welfare institution. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the last question uh -huh. is: uh, uh, There is, uh, according to coping mechanism, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, uh, you know that a coping mechanism is a way that is done by individual in solving problem, adjusting to change. Yeah? Yeah. Ah. Ah, so I want to ask you, uh, what's the problem about a coping mechanism while we're Bali bombing? So if we look at Bali bombing, so uh, actually this relates as well to my question, um, the other question of Professor Dharmaputra uh, before. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we see in 2006, 2007, that the amount of children that are being submitted to orphanages, to child welfare institutions is making a big rise. So what we can uh, see is that there must have been happening something before to instigate this big rise. This must have been the Bali bomb, and um, uh, so the, the, the 2005 Bali bomb, the second Bali bomb. So if we then look at what were people doing at this time, in 2006, 2007, we come across many coping mechanisms. And the first coping mechanism that is mentioned by all the researchers that have been done in that time is decreasing expenditures. So making sure you spend less money. So people started selling their motorbikes, selling their car, selling the land, uh, selling gold, that kind of things. And uh, one of the things to actually save money is to bring your child to a child welfare institution. Because when you bring your child to a child welfare institution, it means that uh, you don't have the cost for school, you don't have the cost for food, you don't have the cost for clothes, for hygiene products. So it's a way to decrease money. And therefore, what is happening now with the COVID-19 situation is again a very uh, scary and difficult situation because the result of my dissertation is could be happening now again. And the first indications with those two girls that I showed earlier uh, is an indication that it's about to happen again. Yeah. Uh, according to 76. Yeah, a person live and know the parent. Yeah, you can. Uh, can you uh, explain that is uh, a 
coping mechanism too, or no? Um, let me see. I, I just went to page 76. Um, and your question uh, is? Is there, is there any relation to the coping mechanism? Um, so on page 76, um, you mean of the dissertation, right? Yeah, 76% uh, uh, the, ah. the children uh, know his parent. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I told you meant page 76 of the dissertation, so I, I was confused. 76% uh, of the children, indeed, both have still, uh, both have, uh, still have both parents alive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And in, in some way, this could be related actually to the uh to a coping mechanism uh, be, because you can say that actually those children both parents still alive should not be living in a child welfare institution uh, uh, this goes a bit back to your first question as well where we can see that 29 out of 50 children are living in the orphanage because of education so um having both parents alive doesn't mean exactly that uh, children can uh, follow education based on the parent's income or not. Yeah. Or that actually following education might not be uh, related to follow education, but more on the fact that maybe parents are not completely uh, interested to actually spend the money while another organization can easily spend it for you and you can do other things with that money. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Rodney. Terima kasih, Ibu. Terima kasih. Ya. Selanjutnya saya persilakan yang saya hormati Saudara Penilai, Dr. Inyoman Wagi, MSI. Terima kasih, Bu Dekan. Selamat siang, Bapak, Ibu, pemuji hari ini. Congratulations untuk Pak Dr. Wedney. Selamat. Uh, uh, I appreciate your uh, achievement in uh, conducting this research because this uh, issue is very interesting, involving the cultural value and humanity value. And this the uh, uh, family is submitting their children to uh, child welfare institution at you know, when they experience a uh, crisis, economical crisis, or other crisis either caused by the social uh, disaster or uh, natural disaster. And this research, I think, part of the psychological uh, research. If we talk about the psychological uh, analysis, there are three, three elements correlated each other in three angel. Perception, attitude, and behavior. In this, when I read your uh, dissertation, I didn't uh, see your, ex, uh, your explanation clearly, firmly. What is the correlation between the attitude, behavior, the, uh, sorry, perception, attitude, and behavior? of the you know the object there are ex at least uh, 50 children sample you uh, be taken uh, including 20 20 percent 23 and, and there is a contrast attitude between the children who have been submitted to the institution with the parent and i don't see your explanation how compromise and this, you know, this uh, problem to minimize the mentality, stress, or the other. Can you explain it? Of course. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, so, um, indeed, the, 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 the buildup of perception, attitude, and behavior is, is an interesting uh, way to dive into the, to the subject as well. I, in my dissertation, I've chosen to do that more by Aletea, Politea, and Ethos. Um, which at the end are, are comparable. Um, 
So a very interesting question to actually look at. So what now, indeed? So we, we, we have the knowledge, this is happening. Uh, what could be done? So um, actually, this is a hard cycle to break, uh, especially when, when we're in this situation now, again, with COVID-19, where likely the same cycle will be started up and, and will be used again by the people. So as we have a law, here in Indonesia, that is very clear and, and very good. The, the level of, of attitude and behavior and, and the perception should be uh, both on the levels of uh, people that are owning child welfare institutions uh, or wanting to start up child welfare institutions to make sure that they do it for the right reasons. So not for the reason to uh, give education to children, not for the reason to change religion or to spread religion, or, and definitely not for the reason to actually have personal gain, um, but for the true reason. And there are a few foundations in Bali that do that very well. Uh, for example, Bali Children Foundation that is uh, operating exactly according to the law. They, what they do is they uh, provide uh, tuition fees, uniforms, uh, that kind of things that children need for school, and they provide it to the family, so the child, and in cooperation with the school, so the child can go to school. Um, instead of taking those children out of their own environment, their family family environment, and to take them to an orphanage, or to to uh, to a child welfare institution that is potentially harmful, this is not a thing that can be changed within uh, one year. Uh, this needs a lot of time to actually change the perception of people because it's not only about the perception of the owners of, uh, of, of those child welfare institutions, but also of the parents and the families. As we saw in the beginning of my presentation where I show that actually some parents have some feeling of shame or guilt, but most, it's totally fine. It's, uh, it's the way it is and even recommend to their uh, siblings or to their to their neighbors. Like, oh, well, I brought my child to this child welfare institution. Yeah, it's all fine. Uh, and then even when we ask those parents, but are you not scared of that your, that your child will be uh, physical, physiological, or, or even sexual abused? We received answers like, yeah, but my brother lives close to it. So if there is something, then I'm sure my child goes to my brother. Or, no, I have full trust with the people that are running the orphanage. Well, actually, when that was being said about this one parent, I, as a researcher, knew that where the child was living, a case of sexual abuse had been happening three years ago. So. It's all about breaking this cycle. And I think this dissertation will be a first step in that of the perception and the attitude and the behavior of both the people that own orphanages or child welfare institutions, but also on, on family level, but also, for example, on school level. Sometimes schools actually say to a child like, oh, well, if your parents cannot pay for school, uh, here you have an address of an orphanage where you can go to. Or, uh, on the level of local government. Um, one of the children being interviewed was actually being brought to an orphanage all the way from Buleleng to Denpasar uh, by the Kiliambanja. Um, so to break the cycle, to break the perception, attitude and behavior, it is very important to break in on certain levels. So on the level of owners of those orphanages, uh, on the level of uh, local uh, government, and on the level of parents, schools. Okay, uh, Pak Rodney, may I know among the submitted in uh, child welfare uh, institution, uh, are they, do the family choose a parallel, parallel yayasan or foundation? I mean, in terms of uh, what is called uh, tradition or like uh, hate or religion, do they uh, choose the parallel? And if not, are there any, this is, I'm sorry, this is a racial question. Are there, do, are there any, when a child converted, converting 
uh, his or uh, her pay. Because yeah. mainly the, the foundation is like a uh, apa uh, kedok ya, yeah. hanya sebagai kedok. Uh, the man be behind the kedok or mask. This is a, a, a difficult question to answer because I have been looking for the vast uh, proof of actually, because if you look uh, at, at what people say uh, about orphanages, it's mainly the Christian orphanages that are being said to try to change religion. Now, there is only one source that uh, I mentioned in my dissertation that is actually saying that this is happening. Now, if we talk the uh, outside of the research moments, so I talked with, uh, with people that are running uh, the orphanages or the management of, of those Christian orphanages. Actually, uh, they admit that the first objective is to uh, spread Christian religion and to uh, spread the love for, for the Christian God. Um, for parents, some uh, some of them they they really chose uh, an orphanage specifically to their own culture or religion. Uh, so that I had a number of of uh, children being submitted to orphanages, to Hindu orphanages, because the parents were Hindu. Uh, but also a number of children being submitted to Christian orphanages, uh, just because that was the first orphanage that they found where they could submit their children. Um, and if you look at Christian orphanages, you see as well that the educational system uh, within those orphanages is better taken care of than within the Hindu orphanages uh, overall. Um, more opportunities, uh, for example, being able to go to university as well and not have, having to stop after high school, um, which for some parents is in, more interesting because there are more chances for those children within a Christian orphanage. And uh, I remember one of the comments of, uh, of a parent that said, well, I don't care if they uh, learn how to uh, read the Bible and to sing Christian songs uh, within uh, that orphanage, because when my child comes home, uh, learn from me uh, how to pray in the temple uh, and, and learn the Hindu teachings. Um, and when I asked, like, well, but doesn't that confuse your kid on who he is and, and how uh, to live life? Then the answer to that was, yeah, that's just the way it is. This way he gets more opportunities. Okay. Uh, uh, Rodney, uh, this is my last question now. And my last question is uh, related to the uh, question of Prof. Ardano and Prof. Anam Kumbara. When I read your uh, dissertation, uh, normally the characteristic of uh, cultural study is very uh, distinctive uh, study, focusing on struggling of power or politics and ideology. Mm -hmm. So uh, this explanation in the uh, description, is your uh, dissertation uh, is a bit uh, narrative descriptive. And I would I wonder, any any agent any agent uh, doing domination how he communize with the other and whoever get profit what kind of profit they get and whoever become a victim in this case and give me your explanation and your recommendation thank you okay thank you for your uh, question um so this is uh, also a very good question uh, because what we know, what is uh, going on in Bali, Bali is a place where many, many tourists come. And um, this means that actually a lot of tourists are visiting orphanages uh, and bringing money, bringing uh, goods, bringing uh, a lot of things to those orphanages. So in certain cases, what we see, what is going wrong in those orphanages, is that actually the objective, so the power, is uh, within the orphanages to receive a lot of money, receive a lot of goods, and actually misuse that position. So what is uh, the, 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 the victim of this is the child itself. Uh, for example, I, 13 years ago, I was 
helping out in an orphanage uh, here in Bali. And within that orphanage, there was uh, one uh, child that was uh, mentally not ill, but had mental issues. Uh, he was not able to, to join a normal school and he should have gone to Escola Luar Biasa or something like that. So the orphanage owner chose that this child was not going to a school because uh, the owner wanted to make sure that there is always one child, and especially one that looks a bit sad, that is that people, tourists that are coming up could identify with, uh, like, oh, this is such a sad little boy. So this boy was deprived of going to school, victimized, to not being able to learn, to read, write, and that kind of things, uh, to, for the personal gain of this uh, orphanage. And the problem there was that even, for example, taxi drivers would get a 50,000 uh, note the moment they brought new tourists. So, of course, uh, the, 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 the taxi drivers would like to bring tourists there because they get an extra 50,000. And 13 years ago, 50,000 was even more than it's now. Um, so yeah, there, there is a lot of abuse that way going on in, in orphanages. Uh, when you enter an orphanage or even while doing this research, I was being asked, for example, to donate to next time when I come uh, to bring rice, to bring food, to bring money. Uh, I got lists of children in my hand that would not be able to go to school uh, in the next period uh, because there was no money to be paid to them. The research took a number of years, and I, returning to those orphanages, I saw that those children were still going to school, even though I didn't pay for the school fee. Um, so if we're looking at the power, and this is one perspective on, on this, uh, this whole issue, the orphanages actually have a lot of power. And the, the ones that are victimized, definitely the children that live in, within it. That's why I'm a big advocate for those children who live uh, with their own family and where child welfare institutions should actually provide help to pay for tuition fees, to pay for other costs for going to school instead of taking those children within their center and let them live outside of their family. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. But Rodney and uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting more Chris, more Chris. Uh, kembali dari Belanda ke Indonesia dan kembali. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best for that. Thank you. Because I'm waiting. <laughs> atas waktunya yang terhormat uh, Ibu Pimpinan Sidang. Uh, ada beberapa uh, dari saya. Should I ask in English? Uh, let me. You, uh, as a woman uh, here, uh, I found a uh, very sorry about um, the uh, novelties that you uh, see that um, a child in um, a child welfare is uh, get um, sex uh, abuse uh, physically and psychological also. As um, that, um, let's say my child is also uh, your child if uh, i think that as a woman so can you explain uh, what should uh, we aware yeah uh, to tell the children or the parents um, the government and so uh, when they meet the children to child welfare institution? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, um, uh, 
Um, the, the, the last part of uh, uh, the last 10 seconds were broken up, so I hope I, I can answer your question. Uh, please let me know if I if I missed the part. Um, thank you for your question. Um, first of all, I, I, in my answer, actually, I hope that uh, no children uh, will be submitted to child well welfare institutions at all. Uh, so that will be the best solution and actually the solution according to the law. Now, uh, having said that, I know that that's at this moment not a uh, real option uh, because it will continue to happen. Now, uh, if we are looking at uh, what should happen to make sure that children are actually speaking up to when uh, they are being abused in those orphanages. Uh, because the moment that children are being abused, uh, the children will uh, need to speak up. Because parents that already submitted children to orphanages, they will not know what is going inside unless the child is speaking up. Now, uh, one thing we, that ch the parents could do before submitting a child is to actually look online. Uh, and Google is giving a lot of feedback on, on, on those cases. Uh, but also Praya Karma, who is uh, uh, basically uh, making sure that these kind of things are not happening and had actually already, uh, the police could actually uh, prosecute quite a number of abusers also within orphanages with the help of the investigation skill of Praya Karma. Uh, that's why I decided as well to the cases of abuse that I discovered to forward them. Uh, we had several meetings about that to Project Karma. Now, uh, one thing that Project Karma is doing is uh, doing trainings for children to learn how to speak up if something is happening what you don't want to happen, either physical, psychological, or sexual. Um, and that's the most important key. Once children can be taught to be vocal and to tell what is going on, the parents and uh, police and, and foundations that are taking care of these kind of cases can make the next step. The moment more and more uh, abusers are being prosecuted, the more difficult it becomes to actually be an abuser. And we saw this in Thailand where many child abusers would go to help in orphanages and to help uh, within child welfare institutions and uh, due to an increase in the law there um, you see that less and less child abusers are actually going to thailand the problem with that is is that more and more child abusers now are actually going to bali All right, um, the other question and uh, any suggestion to firm the institution that to manage um, the child welfare institution to mm -hmm. um, reduce this. Mm -hmm. so, so, um, mm -hmm. For example, uh, uh, Save the Children has a very good code of conduct uh, in which uh, in, in three pages, all kind of rules when dealing with children, international rules are being suggested. Uh, and, um, unfortunately, I only know of two orphanages in Bali that are actually making people sign those kind of conducts when they are coming into the orphanage, whether it be as a visitor, as a volunteer, or as somebody that works there. Um, and those, those uh, rules in those code of conduct are very simple rules. For example, as we work there, you will never be alone with a child in a the room. There is always a four eyes principle. So when you have uh, contact with a, with a child, there is always two uh, adults uh, that are uh, being present. Just to make sure that when two adults are present, uh, one adult cannot do any abuse. Um, and, and this whole list contains of the very simple rules, uh, which are uh, unfortunately not, not well enough implemented, nor is staff uh, being trained on this. Uh, many orphanages have staff that uh, did not uh, 
have any further training than high school, for example, where it is actually very important when dealing with children, you have staff that is trained to actually work with children and knows what, how children think, how they should be educated and how they uh, thrive best within uh, the situation they're in. And unfortunately, even owners or managers of foundations actually do not have these, uh, these skills uh, by going to university, for example, to learn uh, pedagogics. Um, so another thing that, that could be done here is uh, where task plays for uh, Dina Socia, who could do more trainings for uh, orphanage staff to make orphanage staff aware of these kind of uh, code of conduct and how to deal with children uh, the right way. All right. So thank you very much. Um, I accept your um, suggestion. Uh, your dissertation to make it firm. Thank you. Thank you. Selanjutnya kami akan mengadakan rapat judisium untuk meletakkan keputusan promovendus. Kami mohon promotor, promotor tim puji dan ketua panitia pelaksana promosi doktor untuk menuju ruang rapat di dalam WhatsApp. Sidang promosi doktor akan diskor paling lama selama tiga minit.
ใช่รถนี่ can you hear me yes I hear it อารบุญโอ้ตักมาตุนฮัลโหลมาเถอะ I cannot hear your voice. It mute. Yeah. Yes, so somebody is muting me. Oh, see. Okay then. I don't. I don't know to to disturb you. Congrat. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome.
Belum, belum. Saya lagi.
come.
Pegar o copo das e o copo dela. Comenta a vida da Suriana. E se dá para não colocar o copo ali, respirando. Não podemos seguir o copo. Dengar kini, saya nyatakan sidang promosi doktor atas nama Lord Member Sekolah kami, MA, Mas Basel of Education, dibuka kembali. Saya bacakan hasil rapat kebisium saudara promo pendus Lord Member Sekolah kami, MA, Basel of Education, mahasiswa angkatan tahun Akademi 2015-2016. Berdasarkan hasil rapat kebisium promosi doktor dan setelah mempertimbangkan satu prestasi yang telah dicapai promo penis selama dalam pendidikan dua ketekunan dan kesungguhan kerja promo penis dalam melakukan penelitian tiga cara promo penis mempertahankan disertasi dan sumbangan disertasi promo penis terhadap pengembangan ilmu pengetahuan serta penilaian yang telah dilakukan panitia ujian Dr. Kutipo pada tanggal 25 November 2019 dengan segala peraturan dan pemenang yang ada di Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budaya. Dengan ini, sidang memutuskan bahwa disertasi Saudara Promovenus Dr. Neymar Sokakani, MA, Master of Education, diterima. Terima kasih. Dan dengan demikian, saudara telah menyelesaikan pendidikan doktor di program studi doktor S3 Kajian Budaya Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budayana serta dinyatakan lulus dengan predikat sangat memuaskan dan indeks prestasi 3,75. Kepada saudara diberikan hak untuk memakai gelar doktor dengan hak dan kewajiban serta kehormatan yang menurut hukum meletak pada gelar tersebut. Kami atas nama Negara Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budayana mengucapkan selamat dan sukses kepada doktor baru kita, Dr. Rodney Westerwaken, MA, Master of Education. Saudara merupakan doktor yang ke-89 di Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budayana dan doktor yang ke-224 pada program studi doktor S3 Kajian Budaya Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budayana. Selanjutnya saya persilahkan saudara promotor Profesor Dr. Ibaya Abidra MA yang memiliki peran penting atas keberhasilan dokter baru kita untuk menyampaikan pidato singkat tentang prestasi doktor Rodney Westerlaken MA Bachelor of Education tentang makna disertasi. Profesor Dr. Iwayan Adika MA Oh, Swastiastu. Selamat siang. Yang saya hormati Ibu Dekan Fakultas Ilmu Budaya yang saya hormati pula Bapak Ketua Program Studi Kajian Budaya Fakultas Ilmu Budaya Universitas Budayana, para Dewan Penguji, demikian juga co-promotor 1 dan 2 yang saya hormati. Pertama-tama marilah kita memanjatkan puji syukur hadapan Tuhan Yang Maha Esa karena atas berkat rahmatnya lah diberikan kesehatan sehingga pada hari ini kita bisa bersama-sama mengikuti acara ujian promosi doktor atas nama saudara Rudni Westerlaken. Capaian diperoleh oleh saudara Dr. Rudni Westerlaken adalah suatu hal yang sangat menarik karena ini merupakan kontribusi juga dari para Dewan Penguji, co-promotor, dan para penguji sekalian sejak awal proposal hingga 
selesainya dokter ini. First of all, I would like to congratulate to Dr. Rudney Westerlaken for your achievement. Uh, great achievement for you, and we learned a lot from your study. The child welfare institution in Denpasar. From your study, we learned that almost all the child welfare institution in Denpasar breaking the law. In other words, they don't follow the regulation that already declared by the Department of Social Republic of Indonesia. Therefore, what you found in your study, there are a lot of abuse going on on the child welfare institution in Denpasar. In this case, we argue or recommend that Department of Social Affairs should do control against the child welfare institution. Otherwise, we get more our children to be victimized in the welfare institution. The other thing you can learn from your study is how perception, how the behavior of the of child in Bali. If I'm not wrong, that there was a social tolerance getting loose or declining among the family, even in the extended family. Nobody care with the child. So that's why the parent they tend to submitting their children to child welfare institution. Although, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of things that's not unpleasant what's going on at the child welfare unit. Barangkali ini menjadi suatu tugas bagi kita semua ke depan agar kontrol terhadap yayasan anti asuhan ada ditingkatkan oleh Departemen Sosial sehingga itu akan mengurangi terjadinya kekerasan yang berlaku pada anti asuhan tersebut. Karena seluruh pekerjaan tanpa diupah, sehingga juga mempengaruhi tujuan utama mereka di sana untuk belajar, tapi akhirnya mengerjakan pekerjaan yang di luar bidang kependidikan. Sehingga hal-hal seperti itu, kekerasan seperti itu, barangkali di masa yang akan datang tidak terjadi lagi. Particularly in the current situation due to the COVID-19, I believe there will be more children who submitted to the child welfare institution with parents of the economic problem. In this case, again, the Department of Social Affairs should make control, should make action in the use to our children in the institution. At the end, I would like to thank to all the parties who give support and contribute valuable thing for the success of Dr. Rudney Westerlaken. And I do hope that you don't stop just now. I mean, you should continue your research. More things need to be done in the child welfare, welfare institution. I think that's all my speech. And again, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you. Dengan sekali lagi mengucapkan puja dan puji syukur kehadapan Tuhan yang Maha Esa 
disertai ucapan terima kasih kepada semua pihak yang telah ikut berpartisipasi dan membantu penyelenggaraan acara promosi doktor dan dengan permohonan maaf atas segala kekurangan yang terjadi maka sidang promosi doktor dinyatakan ditutup. Santi 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 Mohon maaf yang sebesar-besarnya apabila terjadi kesalahan atau ada hal yang kurang berkenan selama berlangsungnya acara ini. Terima kasih atas partisipasinya. Selamat siang. Oh Santi, Santi, Santi. Oh. Selamat Adni. Selamat, Neng. Selamat ya. Terima kasih. Ya.